U1. Helicopter utility model one. And it looked like a hooey. So if you're a mechanic working on this, I'm going on a year, hooey. And the name stuck. Its actual real name is a Bell UH1 Iroquois. Named after the Indian tribe Iroquois. That is the real name of Yui. Bell UH1 model whatever Iroquois. Now that started before that. If anybody ever seen MASH, put your hand up, you seen MASH? You see the little bubble helicopter, the Bell Sioux. Sioux? The Bell 47 was called the Sioux in US Army use. So the US Army only usually named their helicopter types after Indian tribes, the indigenous Americans in, in America. So, Belso, Iroquois, the Use 086, which is similar to that little helicopter in there, was the Cayuse, another Indian tribe. And nowadays you have Chinook, heard of them, Waka Waka, and of course Apache, the definite Indian tribe. There are others, the US Navy very rarely named them. They used to have numbers like C-47, CH-47s and whatever it was. But the US Army, to this day, name helicopters after the Indian tribe. So, was she a beast? Yeah, she's five ton of lift. Those rotors can produce five tons of lift and that's a maximum all up weight. We flew to Fairford and our chief pilot calculated we are currently burning 100 gallons an hour. So she's rather an expensive and greedy young lady. To beat the air into submission, as you do with the helicopter, um, it takes an awful lot. You imagine you're producing lift by rotating wings. So, before we go any further, a helicopter is called a rotary wing machine. So if you have an airliner, you've all been on airliners, or like, you'd have to go down the runway and Mother Nature eventually lets you go in the air, because your wings produce lift. But you get it wrong and Mother Nature doesn't care, you'll fall out of the sky. Conversely, those are wings at £120,000 each for each blade. So quite expensive pieces of kit. They rotate at a given speed, and if you notice at the moment, they are virtually horizontal. That would spin up and rotate. You're doing nothing at the moment. You can rev up and she just whizzes round. But when you apply pitch, which is that, you then get lift because you're beating the air downwards and cross it. So, with your uh, cycle, uh, with your uh, collective lever in there, you can lift up and, of course, then produce pitch, which then lifts you up. But now you've got to move somewhere. So that head up there on top of the mass gimbals in every direction, just a just a bit like that. So if the helicopter rotates, that's your mast. There's your head. You want to go that way. You tilt the head that way. You go forward. Tilt it that way, you go back, tilt it that way. Does that make sense? You imagine the engineering of spinning all this round and you've got gimbling and you've got pitching. So those have to be checked very, very regularly. <coughs> Obviously, you don't want anything going wrong up there because you're being, uh, as my wife calls it, Dickie's Meadow pretty quickly. Uh, tail rotor, if you don't know what that's for, a bit like an aircraft has a rudder. You can steer left or right, wag its tail, but it's also auto rotate to stop auto rotation because that jet engine is powerful enough. If that comes off, the fuselage will just go round and round the shaft, and you have an uncontrollable incident. And there's no parachute, <laughs> so you don't want that coming off. So that you will rotate, and the uh, a, a, a centrifugal force opposite to the rotation of the blades. That's why you have that to stabilise it. You notice she has a, a little wing at the back that is in for forward motion that acts with the pitch so that it keeps your nose at a nice attitude in flight because if the, that head is high up and it will pull you forward that's why helicopters tend to go like that on takeoff because the head's pulling it forward the nose is getting dragged but eventually it pitches up does that make sense right and the elevator helps you to maintain a level flight uh, guides the aircraft, just like an airliner, just like a normal aircraft. So now we move on. She was one of the world's best helicopters. She had the Allison T-53 engine, called it's a, called a centrifugal, get this right, put your teeth in, centrifugal flow jet engine. 
your airliners will have an axial flow jet engine. It sucks it in, squeezes it, burns it and blows it out the back. This does a bit similar, but it has to go up round a centrifugal fan, back into itself and out through the exhaust. That makes it a very compact engine for the power it's delivering. This powers at 1400, well 1400 shaft horsepower. It doesn't sound a lot, that's about the same power as a Mark V Spitfire in World War II, but it will lift five tons and deliver 12 troops, fully armed, two door gunners, two pilots and a crew chief. To where you want to be. So very, very, very tough helicopter. Um, they had other helicopters, the Chinook did exist in the Vietnam period, but imagine this, if you go on Vietnam footage, I as a young lad was watching outrageous activities done by these, they can manoeuvre incredibly well, and if you imagine 18 up there, just taxi ranking, two on the deck, and two, uh, another 18 coming in, you don't actually stop. That young 18 year old lad with his M16 backpack, sidearm, is going into battle by jumping off the skids. The pilot will not drop you off and say, hey, bye bye, have a nice day, you've got to get out of there. So, if you notice it, they're running along and they just jump out, bang, and they're straight into battle, or straight into a field, and they're away again. So, it's quite common to see at least 40 of these coming into a battlefield. <coughs> now, the Viet Cong, I don't care what you read or what they said, but an extremely competent army. They were battle hardened, they had good state of the art Soviet equipment at the time, Russian equipment, and they knew how to use it. So how do you kill a Huey? Simple. I aim for the gearbox. Oh, you might miss that, it's a small area. There's one area that isn't small, that's your rotor disc. You damage one of those, imbalance it, and she's doing that straight away because the balancing on those is extremely fine to keep, you imagine that, all that weight moving round, and just like your car's flywheel has to balance the engine, it's got to be extremely balanced, otherwise it'll fall apart. So, the Viet Cong uh, commander would say, guys, come here a minute, 12 Kalashnikovs, that's all you need, AK-47, <coughs> you can hear you we're 10 mile away. If when we're flying over the hills over there, Colette's here, she's going to hear you, boop, boop, so the Viet Cong used to say you could actually manufacture a gun, grease it, oil it, arm it and wait till it's arrived. <laughs> so what you do is what you call leading. If anybody has fired a gun, they'll know what lead shooting is or deflection shooting. Does anybody know what deflection shooting is? No? Nope. Right, I'll just describe that quickly. In World War II, a Spitfire pilot, Hurricane pilot, out try to outturn the Messerschmitt fighter and shoot into space where he's going to be when the bullets arrive. Because a clay pigeon shooter shoots 18 inches ahead of the clay pigeon. Yeah, does that make sense? Because your pellets will go. Right, so the lead on this is let it come through, you stand 12 men side by side, are you ready lads? Yeah, we'll have a brew, yeah. Fire! Blah, 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 and they just fly through it. Does that make sense? You're not even having to aim it. <coughs> So the big road to this is, I mean, the Polish pilots in World War II saw Messerschmitt ahead. They don't go for that back end. Too thin, might miss it. Come for a plan form shot. It's a bigger area. It's a bigger area. So, crack on. The strange blades there and underneath, that strange looking blades are cable cutters. They weren't on in Vietnam, but if you're flying into telephone cables or even those types there, good luck. But those are actually cable cutters, so it goes up the rib here, gets caught in the back of that cutter and snaps it before it can get up there to your engineering. That's what they do. Uh, on this aircraft, if you have warning receivers in here, we've, we've not got them in, these little turrets ears are <laughs> radar warning receivers. So if somebody's painting you with a radar guided missile, you know where it's coming from. You can turn the other way, try and get out of the way. Because it's lighting you up with a radar. Have you ever been lit up with radar? Yeah. Even a Stinger missile is it, uh, not able to be read because they go for heat signature. So they'd fire that at the exhaust plume of a car even, and it will find that and disappear up the exhaust pipe and go off with a bang. Uh, right, so, you notice we have M60 machine gun on the side, one on each side. They did start with 50 calibre, but there's one in there. 
problem was that the velocity of a 50 cal is that much that it was bouncing off hard standing and hitting other helicopters over there. So I thought, oh, well, we've got to stop doing that. We're shooting each other down here. Uh, now, the Huey helicopter did Utility Helicopter Model 1 H. This is the H, the more powerful model. Nowadays, they still use them. The twin engine in the US Navy for redundancy. If that engine fails, we have to auto-rotate down. And auto-rotation is almost like the sycamore leaf. You've still enough energy in the blades, you must go forward at a certain angle and you can land, but you are going down. So you've got to look for a nice flat area, auto-rotate down. But if you've got two engines, great, good to go. You can still run the other engine. So the US Navy, want two engine Ueys and usually four blades but they don't go waka 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 anymore Ugh, boring they don't make that nice sound um, there have been thousands upon thousands tens of thousands made of the Ewing type helicopter uh, they've been in civilian use in fact when Sully put that A320 down on the Hudson remember that yeah. massive achievement brilliant guy it was the, US, United, it was the uh, New York police divers who went out and picked a lady up who dumped, panicked, jumped off the wing to swim. It was three degrees the water in the Hudson, she'd have died. And they picked her up in a Huey. Then that police diver jumped, grabbed hold of that lady, got her in the warm and saved her life. Otherwise they would have lost one of the passengers. Thankfully they all survived. Brilliant. So it shows they're in fire suppression duty. I've seen them in Switzerland uh, with the Swiss mountain rescue people. The only downside to them is when there's avalanche danger, that waka 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 noise can set an off. So nowadays they have a quieter four bladed affair. Makes sense? Not boring, yeah, we? Right, good. Uh, speed wise, you're looking at 90 knots, it's about 100 mile an hour. Uh, 100, just a bit over 100, you're getting uncomfortable above 100 and, but one thing about them, you never ever fly a UE in negative G you've got to be in positive at all times so what that intent, you keep the blades loaded none of this, like you can see backflips at air shows on what um, uh, Lynx helicopter you couldn't do that, you fall out of the sky but apart from that, they're a fantastic piece of kit uh, I've flown all over the place in it, we went to Fairford, Gloucestershire Hour and a half. Fantastic experience. That's all, you know. Lucky boy. Lucky boy. I have to pinch myself. Um, <coughs> Phil himself, who owned her, Phil Connolly, he owns a firm called Submarine and Manufacturing SMP, not SNP, Submarine and Manufacturing Products. And that deals with deep submersibles and diver redoubts for commercial divers. Because as commercial divers, you can't come up each day because of decompression. You live down there for a week in 400 feet down or 300 feet down you have to live in a live in a big <coughs> what we call a redoubt and then you have to decompress after that for four days in a tank Ugh, horrible i don't know how they do it these guys but anyway any questions so far good great stuff um helicopter why do you need such helicopter assault vietnam was the first type really the first um war that you need helicopters and if you look at the terrain in Vietnam you know why it's mountainous you've jungle paddy fields you've got all sorts of horrible uh, places you couldn't take vehicles through so the truck of the air that's it I think we're about there I don't want to bore you any longer I'm going to get a bit bored um, no further questions is there an operation in the UK? Is this the only one? Or... No, it's the only H Vietnam vet. Oh yes, nearly forgot. My goodness, good point. The H model, this one, is a Vietnam veteran. If you look inside the back, she will have little yellow dots on the floor. Is where the Kalashnikov rounds pass through her as they try to shoot her down. Bell helicopter. They send it back to America. Bell helicopter repaired, repaired a new fuel tank, which was underneath and a new floor barring the patches. Those patches are where the rounds came straight through and went out through the roof. So she was retired after that, went to the, uh, uh, I think she went to the Air National Guard. But yeah, she's actually been shot down this one in Vietnam. She was there from 71 to 72. 
and uh, she was with, if you look at that strange name on the front, 129 Asselfell, looks like, you, what does that mean? Simply, 129 Assault Helicopter Company. Okay, so now you're filming it, you know what that means, Assault Helicopter Company. And, uh, there were quite a few there.